So patient access to treatment has been an issue that's been part of the CSRO since our inception. That's 15 years of advocacy in that regard. Uh, since then, we have been working with patients and provider organizations uh, to address what uh, you have heard a little bit about today, utilization management uh, tools at the, both the state and federal level. So for those of you that didn't get the message earlier, the utilization management tools that we have been specifically addressing include prior authorization, step therapy, non-medical switching, and the more recent accumulator adjustment program. All of these seem to inhibit our patients' access to care, and so it has been our focus for all this time. Um, here today to talk about some of the most recent efforts are the Honorable uh, Kelly Fenton from Minnesota House of Representatives, Honorable Laura Fine from right here, Illinois House of Representatives, and the Honorable Ralph Masulo from the Florida House of Representatives. This will be moderated uh, here today by Brian Henderson, who is a CSRO and actually W.J. Weiser, Government Affairs Specialist. Thank you, and I'll turn it over to you, Brian. We'd like to thank each of our panelists here today uh, for taking time out of their public duties and private lives to spend some time here with us to strategize about how we can improve the patient access environment in each of the states. Some additional background on each of these legislators. Uh, Representative Fenton is the assistant majority leader in the House in Minnesota and carried uh, the step therapy reform legislation that was signed into law in the past year. Representative Fine uh, currently serves in the House in Illinois representing the 17th district, my own district actually. Um, <laughs> And she carried both the step therapy reform legislation in 2016, um, as well as the non-medical switching legislation in 2018. Representative Masulo is a practicing dermatologist uh, out of Florida, and he has carried the non-medical switching initiative out of Florida. So to begin, I'd like to ask you how you got involved in this issue, who approached you, how you became educated on it, and what got you uh, invested so that our audience can understand the process of getting legislators to buy in to these patient access issues. Uh, Representative Fenton, I don't know if you'd like to start off. Thank you. You know, um, I was one of 20 legislators that was invited uh, to a conference um, to learn more about the pharmaceutical industry. And um, throughout that process, I was asking a lot of questions that I've heard in here today, such as, what is the purpose of P PBMs? Do we need them? How can we get rid of them? Those type of questions. So I actually um, was approached from um, some people shortly after that saying, hold off on those issues. We have something in mind that we'd really like we need to get past in Minnesota. Um, and prior to step therapy, the step therapy bill that I carried, prior authorization had been the bill that had always been introduced but never got anywhere, never got a hearing. So um, it, it really started there, just building a consensus with people outside of the legislature who had uh, you know, been working in other states and whatnot. Representative Fine, would you like to add to that? Um, sure, so I, sh I chair the insurance committee, and I'm sorry, I feel like I'm in my grandfather's chair. This is <laughs> <laughs> such a big chair. Um, so, and much of my legislation has been focused on um, insurance reform on behalf of the consumer. And so getting to where we got this year with non-medical switching has been really a six-year process of making sure that patients get their uh, prescription medications on time, then the step therapy bill, and now we're, we focus more on pricing this year with the non-medical switching. So everything is like a small baby step, but we're, we're definitely building and building and building until we get it all done. For me, it was an easy move as a patient advocate, being a physician. It was important for us to see how the cost of pharmaceuticals impact the care of our patients. As a dermatologist, we use a lot of biologics similarly to you all, plus other medications that are also new and expensive. And the fact that we had patients in our practice that couldn't get access to the medications that actually worked for them made me interested in the particular bill. Great, great to hear. So one of the areas that we'd like to explore today is something that I think Representative Fine touched on, is what's happening between the goalposts. 
on legislation between introduction and a final vote that physicians can become engaged in. Um, issues where they're not just sending a letter right prior to a vote. What's the groundwork that's being laid prior to session or the things that are going on behind the scenes that they can become engaged in. I know Representative Fenton, you passed a step therapy reform measure in just a single year um, through a tough legislature. So would you like to expand on some of your, or give us some of your insight on how you were successful? Thank you. Well, first of all, you need to look at the entire big picture. When I was first approached to carry this legislation, the very first question I asked is, who would be opposed to this and why? And what might the arguments be? Um, the other thing I was willing to, was able to do was I actually, from the time that we dropped the initial bill to the end where it was signed into law, I had been able to get every stakeholder to the table um, to be a part of it. The plans approved the legislation, the PBM, so mo everybody, the patient, um, the patients. You know, when I started hearing the stories such as those with MS, and one of the um, authors of the prior authorization bill is one of our legislators who has MS. And then you find out if they don't get that right drug um, the first time, that disease progresses, but you can't reverse that progression. So I knew how important it was and how important it was to get everybody to the table where we could say yes. So I'm vice chair of the Commerce Committee. And there came a point where um, we were close, I was close to closing that deal with everybody. But then you see, if you don't get a bill hearing, you'll see feet start to drag. And I was able, I basically went and called in my favor with the chair and said, I need you to schedule that bill now because I need to close the deal and I think that's the only thing that's um, going to happen. But, you know, so it, there was a lot of months of negotiation and I'll be honest, the PBMs were the last ones to come to the table. But finally when they saw that this was something that was moving and that we were serious about, they finally came and um, had a few tweaks but I was able to work with everybody and get everybody to yes. And when that bill left the House floor, it had a uni unanimous vote. I think you made a really good point about the difference between support in a committee and broader support amongst the legislature itself, where there might be attendant challenges with specific committee members that don't necessarily share um, the general consensus of the legislature. I don't know if either of you have had to overcome some of these obstacles in the passage and working on your own legislation. I think personally that's the most difficult part of running a bill is through committee. If you can get a bill to the floor, most likely it's going to pass, uh, particularly if, if the majority usually controls the committees by and large. So if the majority in the committees pass a bill, and it, they go through several iterations based on what the bill is uh, for the step therapy, in, in our state, it had to go through health care. It also had to go through insurance. And then it had to go and be approved in rules. So to go through those three committees and, and actually pass, chances are it will pass on the floor. But the big point that she made is it's relationships. Because your opponent, which let's say the PBMs in that case, they end up being the opposition until they're working on damage control, and they'll come back to the table. So hopefully the bill will be massaged in such a form that it will be somewhat acceptable to them, or at least more acceptable than it would have been in its original form. I think to add to that, it's uh, a lot of determination. You can't give up because, um, uh, as Brian knows, he worked with me this year on the, the non-medical switching bill. And there were times where you didn't even have to pull your hair out because it was just falling out. Um, because there was just so much, um, the opposition came out. And sometimes when the opposition comes out, they don't necessarily tell the truth. They tell what they can in order to kill a piece of legislation because they don't want that legislation to pass. And usually the case is they don't want it to pass because it's going to hurt their bottom line. And so with us, our coalition, um, we, 
we pretty much got together and held strong. And our, our beginning goal was we just want to make sure that if somebody's stable on their medication, the price of that medication stays stable throughout that contract year. And I mean, I can honestly tell you that um, I worked on this bill for about two years, and I was never so offended as when I sat down in a room with, um, at the beginning of the stages, with some of the opposition, with people from the PBMs, and then I think I had mental health in the room with me, um, rheumatologists I think were in the room, AIDS was in the room, and some of the from the PBMs said to me, you know, when anybody ever introduces a bill, it's because they're in the pocket of the pharmaceuticals. And I was, I mean, I don't lose my temper very easily, and I lost it on her. And she never came back again because that was just not, you know, that, that was not the purpose of the legislation. This legislation, it's all patient-centered. And when somebody tries to say, oh, well, you're trying to do this because of that, that tells me they're trying to fish ways to kill the bill. And that's where you really have to stay determined and remember what your end goal is so you can get it across the finish line. I think this raises an excellent question um, regarding how to communicate complex or nuanced medical information um, in support of patient access le legislation or patient safety legislation. It's very easy for an insurance company to say, well, premiums will rise, prices will increase, um, and tough to rebut that argument for people who accept it sort of blindly. So what role do you see for physicians um, in educating legislators, and what's the best way to communicate that information, particularly for people who don't have a background in medical science? Well, I, I'll start that. I think it's being empathetic to what they think is right. And that, that's an important thing in any kind of negotiation. You, you don't necessarily have to agree with the individual that you're dealing with, but you at least have to understand where their positions are and where they're coming from. Because once you do that, then you could explain your position to them. When we're dealing with cost of medicine, and we had a little discussion earlier before this particular uh, panel, medicine cost have a cost at the time that you purchase the medication. But there's also a cost of care based on how that medicine actually works for our patients. We know that as physicians. We know that if we don't give the patient the right medication, the cost of their care is going to increase because they'll be sicker, or they'll have comorbidities, or they'll have to have some other particular testing that is also expensive before we have to put them on or we're, we're actually prescribed to put them on another medication. And it's important to try to explain those aspects to that individual and see where they're coming from when we're trying to negotiate. We want them to get to that moment where they say, that's right, not just you're right. Because if they say you're right, they're almost placating you. And that's a, that's a good way that they can walk away from that discussion and, and feel that they still believe as they believe. You want them to get to the point where they say, that's right, because that's sort of the moment where they will see your point. And that's true where you're negotiating with a, a stakeholder or a fellow legislator. Now, the both of you not having backgrounds in um, a medical field, what do you think have been the best communicative strategy that you've found for your colleagues? Uh, for my colleagues, it, interestingly enough, how everybody's background comes into play, my background was in journalism, and the first thing I ever learned in my first journalism class was the KISS method, which is keep it simple, stupid. And that's why when, as a legislature, we have literally hundreds of bills thrown at us every session, and you have to figure out how am I going to understand this, what's the best way to do it. And what I find for myself and for my colleagues is that personal story, and that's what sticks with you. So when we were working on the non-medical switching this year, we worked with a family that had a daughter who had severe epilepsy, who seized about 100 times a day. And it took years to get her on the proper medications. This mother came in and told her story and said, if my daughter's medication price changes, I'll no longer be able to afford her monthly medication. And I think she said it could go up like $9,000. People understood that, and, and that's what stuck with them. So they realized the importance of the bill because of this financial feature was to make sure that people can stay stable 
um, for their contract year. So I really think when you keep it simple and don't get into the weeds and just say, hey, this is what this bill will do, that's what helps sell it to my colleagues. So for me, my background is education. So um, I uh, could easily or you know, use that background to convey a message to my colleagues. But I also speak to the general public and those I was working with, those um, who are living with the chronic disease, they became my advisors. The doctors, the plans, they became my advisors because I'm not going to pretend um, to know it all. I don't. But I will go find um, those people that I can trust, those people sharing their everyday stories with me. Um, and I will ask, can I keep in touch with you as I have more questions along the way? And then I could take that knowledge back to my colleagues as I was um, moving the step therapy reform bill through the process. I, I think that you know, builds on a point that Kevin made earlier in this conference about maintaining a consistent and continuous relationship with patient advocates in, in the legislature. So no one you know, certainly knows more about that than a practicing physician who has also been a legislator. But what, what do you see um, in terms of the importance of maintaining that consistent contact and how can physicians be proactive about communicating about emergent utilization management tools to legislators and getting buy-in from them so that they can be addressed before they have an outsized impact on patient populations. I think Representative Lipp said it well, you know, get to know the people that are representing you. And that has to do with getting to know them in their home districts. It's very important that the people that we feel that have credibility with us are those individuals that we have relationships with. And as physicians, we have to be very careful because sometimes we can talk in terms that are over the head of most individuals. And when you, we do that, they tend to shut us down. It's not that they're trying to ignore us. It's just that they don't understand those concepts that you're trying to explain. So as Representative Fine said, we need to use that KISS method. And it's, it's very important uh, to be consistent with it as well. I think that you can go to events, you should go to town hall meetings, and as physicians, we're busy. Most of us are busy taking care of patients, and it's difficult for us to find that time. But it's important because it, it matters not only economically to you all, it matters to the care of your patients. And I think if legislators understand the concepts that we are trying to present and why, they'll be more on our side than they will the larger corporations that are mainly motivated, by and large, with dollars and cents. You know, I, I would add to this, too, is um, we're everyday, ordinary people. We just have an election certificate. I think my daughter put it well when she said, my mom's the perfect example of anybody could get elected. <laughs> but, and, and that stays Don't with sell me. yourself short. But, but to, the general, to the general population, the citizens in which we represent, um, many of them are fearful. They never have approached a legislator. And they're fearful and they don't know how, or um, they're nervous when they come talk to, you know, and I remind them, I'm just like, I'm a wife, I'm a mother. I'm just, I'm an everyday citizen. Um, but I will tell you this, my, I see my own emails. I read my own emails. I answer most of my own emails. But my, the best advice I can give is share from your heart. Tell the stories from your heart. Um, there are many broad and uh, well-funded coalitions out there pushing for something. And day in and day out, I will get form letter after form letter after form letter. But I will tell you, when you take the time to put it in your own words and share your own story with me, you're going to the top of the list. And I, I answer those um, emails personally myself. Um, but if it is a form letter and as life gets busy in the legislature, I may turn those over to my LA to, at, to have him um, reply to those. But the personal um, stories from your heart, the personal reach out to me, are going to go to the top of the list, and you're going to hear from me directly. I'd yeah. also add to that, uh, try to meet with your legislators when you're not busy. It doesn't necessarily mean there has to be a bill on the table. It's just forming that relationship. So when then something does come up, 
we know who to contact or you know who to contact when you contact us. And I really recommend seeing them uh, in their district instead of like, for example, in Illinois, to, to meet me for the first time in Springfield, you could set up an appointment in my office. I don't know if I'm gonna get there because our schedules get so crazy while we're there. But if you set up an appointment in district, you'll really have the luxury of sitting down, getting to know each other, being able to talk, and uh, just starting to form that relationship. And that's so important because that way, let's say there is a bill coming up and I don't know about it. You could just call me at the office and say, hey, remember when we met? Well, now I just want to put this on your radar screen. And that really, I, I always feel like, wow, they really took the time because they took the time to meet me and now they're taking the time to follow up. Mm -hmm. I, I would, uh, I would agree with that. And uh, another representative said that they give their cell phone out to everyone. I don't do that. <laughs> um, if I did do that, uh, I would not be able to even have it anywhere near me because it would be ringing constantly. But I do give it to people that I meet with, that I trust, as you would do. And I think that's important. Well, what I, I think I'm hearing is that it's important to be engaged outside of the period of session itself so that the, as representatives, you know who your experts are on these various issues. And you can also see education on complex matters um, so that it can speed the process of responding to emergent issues. I know that everyone here in this room has heard a lot today about issues that they might not have heard about before. I know that our board has heard um, from people they've been meeting with about issues that are popping up, and I think that this is a very valuable tool um, for everyone in the room to use to meet in district outside of session. So I do, that brings me to the point of what is the groundwork that's being laid before session when there is a piece of legislation being considered? What should physicians be aware of um, that they should be involved in in preparing for session in order to be successful? Anyone can answer. Well, I think sometimes it's difficult because um, in Florida, we have to be reelected every two years. So, and this is an election year. It's most of the legislation now, with all the chairs changing, governor's race, what have you, that a lot of the legislation is sort of up in the air and the bills have not been formulated yet. So that's why I think it's important if you have an issue to get with the advocacy groups and try to present those issues to the various legislators so then they can formulate when they're formulating their bill package to maybe to be able to include yours in it. If you know of an issue that's going to be brought up, which I think oftentimes the best thing is history, if a bill did not go completely through last year, you could talk to those legislators because oftentimes they may want to present it again or they may have learned through whatever reason to not ever bring that back, <laughs> and that often happens as well. But these type bills, these policies that we're talking about, they have national attention, and they're getting passed in certain states, and that creates a momentum so I think it's important that you continue to advocate for the issues that are important to you and your patients. If I could add to that too, um, there's a saying, it says nothing ever dies in Springfield. And what that means is you might introduce a bill one year, but it could take many years to actually really shape it, form it, and pass it. And so I guess my advice for the advocates would be, um, don't be alarmed if it doesn't get through the first time around. And also, be wary of your expectations because we all know what we want to see passed in a piece of legislation, but then the art of compromise has to come in. And if we could take a baby step, that's a lot better than doing nothing. So when usually when I uh, put in a piece of legislation, I throw everything in it plus the kitchen sink, knowing that I'm going to have to compromise, and I know what I'm willing to take out ahead of time, and I know what I really want to get past. So if you think you're going to get it all done at once, it'll be a letdown. Uh, but if you know that any step is a major achievement, uh, then that keeps you going and gives you the um, enthusiasm that you need to take the next step, possibly the next year. So with my step therapy reform legislation that we passed, I actually started on that about three months ahead of session with the stakeholders for the initial draft of the bill. So um, in there, because I knew 
um, when we came back in, in our second year of a term is actually shorter and much uh, more fast and furious. So I knew I was kind of looking at the deadlines, each committee deadline, um, the different committees that had to get through. Um, are there different places you could park a bill, such as it was step therapy was in an omnibus. I also was able to get it on its own. I mean, so I started working with the stakeholders about three months um, ahead of time. And I set the expectation that because this is a shorter session, um, that we would have a very, it would be my top priority. We'd have a great thorough discussion, but I didn't promise um, to get it all the way through. It just, the stars aligned partway through session. <laughs> Now, you did touch on a good point about the negotiation process, and we're all loath to give up important protections we think that patients should have that will improve their access, but what are some of the other strategic considerations that physicians should take into account to ensure that they get the strongest bill possible or get through the negotiation process? In what regard? So, for, for example, in, in Illinois, um, Laura mentioned how she has the throw of the kitchen sink at it uh, method. Are there, um, you know, additional provisions you should put into a bill? Should you attach it to another bill? What um, kinds of things can prepare you to negotiate successfully with the opposition? I think all those are important. Um, it, it seems like we all, you know, even though Donald Trump is not always the most popular president, the idea of the art of the deal where you're trying to negotiate something that you're trying to get more into the original negotiation than what you think is going to actually happen in reality is important. But I, I think that as far as dealing with opposition, you want to be able to present something to them that they want. And in politics, well, from what I learned, and, and I'm a novice still, it's, it's important that you try to agree with your opposition on some other point. And oftentimes, there's a give and take there. And in this particular arena, the give and take oftentimes is with the insurance companies and the PBMs. I want to add to, because I had some interesting happenings uh, mm -hmm. when, I, when we got the step therapy reform passed. And that was, um, as you heard me say earlier, I. I saw a point where some of those at the table negotiating with me started to drag their feet. So I said, let's calendar the bill now so I can close the deal. Also during that point, some had called and they're like, I really don't know if I like this. And I just said, um, look, if we can come to this agreement, I can get this bill all the way now. And do you want something or nothing at all? What is it? Um, if you've ever, I'm a movie buff. If you've ever seen the movie Any Given Sunday, the famous, infamous Al Pacino locker room speech, you can Google it on YouTube. Um, he talks about the, the um, winning, they're in the toughest battle of their life. They got to win the big game. This is your team around you. Um, but you've got to move that ball inch by inch and you'll discover that you'll be in the end zone rather than throwing the Hail Mary pass. During, so one thing that happened, um, remember when I asked, I always ask, what will the op who will be opposed, what will they say? Um, two hours before the final committee hearing, after I had requested it months prior when the bill initially dropped, I get a fiscal note on the bill. Oh. And you know that a fiscal note pretty much will signify death when you're, you've already passed your budget and it's a supplemental budget year. It's going to be death. And I just so happened that I had time to read through it. And um, the, the author that carried the prior authorization, um, you know, I went and talked to him when I to, decided to carry the step therapy because I wanted him on my side and he was all the way. But I also, because of how emotional he got and some bridges that were burned, um, I knew that if he were on it with me, there might be some red flags from some of the opposition. So I finally said, it's time, it's time to bring in um, Rod. I, I need him to do some stuff. And I went, because he was on the Health and Human Services Committee, and I planted questions after reading through the fiscal note, $800,000 fiscal note, where in other states, 
it was zero. <laughs> and um, I was suspicious that the, the budget and management office who does our fiscal notes, I was suspicious that they may have actually given it to one of the PBMs to do. Mm -hmm. And my gut instinct was right, and I was able to fish that out in this committee hearing, it just completely blew up. And what was amazing about it is that one arm, uh, what of, we'll just say CVS, they were on board with the bill, but I don't think that the lobby portion talked to the fiscal, um, the PBM portion. And so what had happened was I went from $800,000 fiscal note to zero in less than 12 hours. <laughs> Um, but, you know, you have to be always thinking and strategic. You know, I had a hunch. I put questions to a person on the committee who asked him. And if you were that one company you w and watching that committee hearing, you would have been cringing and calling and saying, give him a zero right now. So I, I think this raises a good point that there are relationships that have to be built and managed outside of the legislators themselves. Who do you think are important, um, I guess, administrative departments to build relationships with so that when a fiscal note is being considered, they go to the physicians instead of the PBMs to get their input, or at least get their input in general? Every department has staff, and the staff usually have a much longer time to service than the legislators. So it's important to get to know your staff and for whatever it is. We had a $9 million fiscal on a bill because they went to the PBMs. <laughs> and it ended up being $50,000 in the end because you have to keep, continue to go back and, and ask the proper questions. But another thing that's important in that is the staff, the, the chairs of the various committees, oftentimes have influence over the staff. And your legislators can tell you who the chairs are of those various committees, and it's important that you communicate and have a relationship with them as well. Well, I hope that inspires people to be proactive about developing those relationships in response to challenges like fiscal notes. I know, Representative Fine, you faced your own difficulty with that on the non-medical switching legislation. Uh, how, how did you overcome it? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we faced a lot of challenges. I think. Uh, what was helpful for me uh, was as the chair of the insurance committee, uh, the insurance industry pretty much knows where I stand by now, and they're willing to work with me. Where, versus six years ago, they would work against me. Now they're going to, you know, on this piece of legislation, they didn't really you know, voice their opinion during the negotiations, but they quietly suggested some things to me, what they think could help me work in the right direction. Uh, it also helps, so you never know, you never make an enemy because, what is it, a frenemy? You never know who's gonna be on your side. Um, it also helped that um, I went to the minority leader and worked with him in this legislation, and he really got it because the minority leader in Illinois has a daughter who's diabetic. And so he really understood what this bill meant. And so when um, really, you know, I don't mean to keep throwing the PBMs under the bus, but they were our main That's opposition right. <laughs> in this legislation. Um, I learned so much about them. Uh, well, they, they were the ones that really told my colleagues things that weren't true about these bills and um, really tried to kill the legislation. And uh, then one day I had a meeting in the minority leader's office with some of the stakeholders and some of the opposition. And it was at that time they finally realized that this was just not going away. So they were either gonna work with us or as I think you had mentioned earlier, it was going to pass and they were gonna be really unhappy with what passed. And so I think building these coalitions and building that trust is really what you need to make a really a difficult piece of legislation move forward. And just knowing don't give up because so many people are gonna benefit once this bill becomes the law. Well, that's great to hear. I want to talk a little bit about some of the unexpected or more out there arguments you've heard against utilization management reform legislation, because as you mentioned, it's very easy for opposition to lie about the <laughs> content of a piece of legislation or make sh arguments with kind of shoddy uh, evidence to back them up. Um, so how, you know, what are, what are the things that physicians be, should be prepared to hear 
so that they can talk about them with legislators before the PBMs do. I can uh, say something to this because it happened in, um, in that fiscal note as I was reading through the fiscal note. One of the claims that was made was that um, they would be doing away with um, step therapy altogether. And um, if you read through the bill, there's absolutely nothing in the bill anywhere that stated anybody would have to do away with step therapy. And um, so during the hearing, I pointed out that if, if, this, if they're going to do away with step therapy, it is by their own choice and choice alone. The other thing you would hear is that um, cost, premium, you know, something was going to cost more, whether it be drugs, cost of care, uh, or whatnot. But when, but when you tell the story of step therapy, is that, um, you know, I just position it. Look, right now, health plans are telling your doctor how to treat the patient. If you want to improve health outcomes um, right away, we need to bring that decision back between the doctor and the patient who understands their needs the best. But, um, you know, so that was, we're going to do away with step therapy. The cost is going to be more. Currently, the cost to the patient under step therapy, I think, um, there are more long-term costs, and there are um, outside, outside of medical costs like time lost in work, hospital, you know, if, you, if you've got a hospital stay, how long is that? Um, all those sorts of things. Those were the typical ones we heard. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that 100%. As a matter of fact, what you're hearing from up here are individuals that actually went through this process, and we understand that. I, I think it was uh, Dr. Hodley who, in the last lecture he said, don't come to us and say, we just don't like it, or it's not right, because that's not going to fly. You have to try to explain to them why. And I think as physicians, we can tell them where the actual costs are. Any opponent we have has always been the advocate for the public trust, it seems, no matter who they are. And uh, that's the nice thing about our system. We could have somebody arguing really loud at the top of their lungs on one issue, and someone else that's totally against them on another issue. And the two come together. So it's important for you all to go out there and explain in, in KISS terms what those costs are and why it's important for the people that are most expertise in doing anything, in this case, patient care, to be in charge of what that care would be. Another. Um a sort of simple way to go around what might not be the truth out there is uh, for a piece of legislation, everybody's going to get a fact sheet. And that fact lays out the simple ideas of what this bill is about. The opposition is also going to put out a fact sheet with why this bill should not pass. It's always helpful to get that opposition sheet as soon as you possibly can. So you can put in the opposition to the opposition fact sheet to say that they said this, but that's not going to happen, and here's what the truth is. Uh, so that way people can really get to the heart of the matter and get the legislation through. So I want to circle back really quickly with the brief time we, we have left to some of the process challenges that are faced. And specifically, eventually the bill is going to make it out of the primary sponsor's hand and move on to another chamber if you don't have a concurrent piece of legislation mm -hmm. running there. How can physicians be involved to assist you to ensure there's continuity of momentum into a new chamber where there might be a different political appetite? Well, I would say you can't, just because it passes in the House does not mean it's going to pass in the Senate. Mm -hmm. I mean, confidentially speaking, there was a saying that we had in Minnesota, the Senate is where all good bills go to die. I mean, <laughs> I mean that lovingly because I love my Senate counterparts. But um, the fact is, is they, they have a one-seat majority. So unless they have everybody together on it, they're not going to bring that bill forward. But um, you, you need to advocate. When you're advocating in the House, you need to not stop there. You need to advocate in the Senate. Me as a bill author, I uh, went and um, pleaded with the Senate to hear once I got the bill changed and moving, and they saw how it changed, they actually picked it up as well. But, it, but I'm one person. It helps when you share your stories, but not with just one chamber 
but another, and even all the way up to the executive branch. Mm -hmm. okay. And there, there are some tricks that can be played. Like, I, for me, I'll always, when I'm working on a bill, I'll choose my Senate sponsor ahead of time and have them do something called pre-file for a bill. Because if nobody pre-files to take you know, ownership of that bill in the other house, then what could happen is the opposition industry could get a hold of it and get somebody that they want to, to file for the bill so that they can kill the bill. So you kind of have to be two steps ahead. And then, um, just like you said, once that bill gets out of the house, you're, I, I know with me, I, I kind of um, get very attached to my legislation. And I can't just say, OK, go, go be free. I follow it over. Mm -hmm. And then I'll work with the Senate sponsor and um, work with, you know, these are the people I talk to. Now you have to, you know, these are the people you have to talk to in the Senate. Because just like you said, we could work so hard to get it through one house, and then it could be totally dropped in another. So you just have to make sure that you hold the hand of the bill all the way to the executive office. I will say, I, I too, I went and actually stood on the Senate floor <laughs> when my bill got sent over to make sure that nobody in the Senate messed with the language <laughs> of it because time was of the essence. And my language had to match the Senate language to get it to the governor. So I made sure it was known that I was in on the Senate floor too. But well, let's go. I was going to say it's important to pick the right Senate sponsor, as Representative Fine had said. And uh, it doesn't take long when you're in the legislature to get to know all the parties involved. We have 160 people in, um, in Florida in the legislature. There's 120 in the House and 40 in the Senate. There's only two physicians, though. There's a uh, preponderance of attorneys, as I'm sure there is in most legislators. But it's very important that you, you select the right individual if, if the bill is your personal bill. Now, we only have six bills each as House members in Florida, where the senators can have as many bills as they want. So there's a little bit of competition there between the senators trying to pick the individuals that they want to carry the, the appropriate bills. But you'll get to know people that are in health care, which obviously is the idea that we want to present to. And uh, I think you get to know them, and then you present your bills to them, and hopefully they'll continue to carry it along. Well, briefly before we open up for questions, I'd just like to say that the attendees have an opportunity to help build that educational infrastructure that we've been talking about, that groundwork. Um, today, we have here with us from the Autoimmune Related Diseases Association, Randy Ruta, if you want to stand up. They're filming testimonials for physicians who want to explain utilization management issues to legislators. So if you'd like to participate in that, receive a copy of that video that you can then disseminate uh, to your representatives or other interested parties. They're going to be right across uh, from the registration table in the Dearborn room during the cocktail reception. For other states as well, in addition to Michigan, which there will be a campaign in uh, other states as well. So does anyone have any uh, questions before we conclude? I have a comment. Absolutely. Do you want to get up to the microphone, or we'll have someone bring one over to you? Yeah. My name is Mary Jo Weidman. I'm from Albuquerque, New Mexico. And uh, this whole step therapy thing, everything you've said is just spot on because it had been tried to be passed once in New Mexico and it failed. And so it worked again. They had two sponsors, one in the Senate and one in the House that would sponsor it. But I think the thing that, that really moved it ahead was the fact that we got our own patients involved in this. They went, they went to Santa Fe, they met with the governor, they met with the legislators, they gave their message, uh, they did op-eds, uh, one of them which I sat through. And you're, you know, you're sitting with an editorial board that knows nothing about 
autoimmune diseases. Mm -hmm. And these patients, by the time, excuse, sorry, <laughs> by the time they got done talking to them, you know, one was a gal that was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis right before she delivered. She went nine months because she had to go through step therapy of two drugs that didn't work where she couldn't even pick up her baby. So these messages were important for these people to hear, you know, to, for this whole big paper to support this law. And that happened in other cities, you know, within New Mexico. Um, you know, our physicians got involved doing op-eds that countered the big gorilla on the block insurance carrier whose who's op-ed essentially said, this is just going to jack the prices up and cost more, you know, if we, if we put this step therapy in place. And, and he could counter that and show, you know, there's damage that occurs that's never going to be recovered. So it's just important, I think, to get your patients involved, to know your legislators and not stop. MJ, I would point you over to Randy, over down at the Yes. Oh. Are we all? Oh. <laughs> Thank and you. The, the patients and the patient stories are why I carried this bill. I mean, if you're battling MS, psoriasis, Crohn's, um, cancer, I think every um, chronic illness coalition got behind um, this legislation, but those stories from the individuals or the parents of the children <coughs> who are dealing with epilepsy, those matter in these situations the most. Could we, could we cut to the questions, uh, just brief questions and, and answers, and we'll stay a little bit more on target. Harry Watcher from uh, Virginia. Um, I've been trying to get step therapy through the Virginia legislature the last couple of Three years now, um, I'd like your I'd like your opinions about um, uh, how do you work through things when the leadership of the majority party is not interested in, in doing anything. It, it's very difficult, um, if not impossible, to be honest with you. But again, it's in in what we do, whether it's medicine, politics, picking up your trash, it's relationships. And you have to build those relationships in time. And you, you have to show those individuals, and, and let's just assume they're, they're decent people in office for the right reasons, and I think 99% of them are. They will see your point eventually. And so you have to keep knocking on that door. And Could I would say it's two, it's two ways. Um, not only do does the you need from a minority to try to un have the majority understand, but the majority also needs to garner the support of the minority as well. Mm -hmm. Could we go to Wamboy? Yeah, thanks. Uh, my name is Wamboy Mashama, rheumatologist in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I'm a rookie, I'm a newbie, thanks to Dr. Goldman, mm -hmm. and this has been excellent. I think my question has been answered by a couple of questions you guys have asked, but I'm interested in that step, step therapy legislation that it says there are 2019 judges a state of interest. And my question is advice, how involved CSRO, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to get personally involved in this. Uh, I've heard about the patients, I've heard about the in, interactions, I've met with all the state representatives, including our former Tom Price, and they actually told me why the legislation went down, but I have no idea how to be involved to bring it back again for next year's session. I'll tell you what, I'll give you my card, um, and I'll connect you with some of other patient advocacy organizations who are involved with that in addition to ourselves, um, and we can discuss how you can become involved. Thank you, Brian. Mm -hmm. We have one last question. With respect to the influence of industry, be it PBMs or health plans or pharmaceutical industry, uh, how do we wrest control back from the foxes who are guarding the hen house? Or is it just enough to know that they're in charge uh, when you go into it? So how do, you, how do you pull some of the influence out if they're writing the bills or behind the scenes manipulating the bills? You just have to have advocates in charge. Uh, and that's what it boils down to. And especially with pieces of legislation that have to do with health care, um, I don't think step therapy only, you know, 
influences Democrats. I don't think, you know, if you're a Republican, you're not going to have to worry about step therapy. So this is uh, legislation that really impacts anyone, and it is completely nonpartisan. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's why we have to, to make sure just everybody works together. And I know in Illinois, if I, I really believe that if somebody from the minority party was carrying this bill, their best bet is, okay, I need to get somebody from the majority party to co-sponsor it with me, mm -hmm. and we could work on this together, and then you can get it through. Because mm -hmm. again, these are nonpartisan issues, um, so politics really shouldn't be played. And as long as the consumer is the um, be-all end all and the advocate groups are supporting us, we can get the job done. And once it starts passing in one state, like we saw with step therapy, it's kind of like a domino effect. Well, you can give us all these arguments you want in whatever state you're in, but they're not seeing that where it's already passed. So it makes those arguments very hard to stand and hold water anymore. Thank, thank you, panel. That was excellent, uh, Laura, and it's going to be a great segue to the next talk. So thank you all for being here. Um.